Till Death Us Do Part Till Death Us Do Part is a British television sitcom that aired on BBC One from 1965 to 1975. The show was first broadcast as a comedy playhouse pilot, then in seven series until 1975. Six years later in 1981, ITV continued the sitcom for six episodes, calling it Till Death. The BBC produced a sequel from 1985 until 1992, In Sickness and in Health. Created by Johnny Spate, Till Death Us Do Part centered on the East End Garnet family, led by patriarch Alf Garnet, Warren Mitchell, a reactionary white working class man who holds racist, prejudiced and anti-socialist views. His long-suffering wife Else was played by Dandy Nichols, and his daughter Rita by Eunice Dubbs. Rita's husband Mike Rollins, Anthony Booth, is a socialist layabout. Alf Garnet became a well-known character in British culture and Mitchell played him on stage and television until Spate's death in 1998. In addition to the spin-off in Sickness and in Health, Till Death Us Do Part was remade in many countries including Brazil, A Grand Familia, Germany Ein Herz und Seele, and the Netherlands, in Vor Antagens Pod, and it is known to the United States as the show that inspired all in the family. Many episodes from the first three series are thought to no longer exist having been wiped in the late 1960s and early 1970s as was the policy at the time. Although Spade claimed he wrote the series to challenge racism, it was felt by some critics that many people watched it because they agreed with Alf Garnett's views. The linguist Alan Crosby has argued that the constant use of the phrase Scousekit with reference to Anthony Booth's character spread both the word Scouse and negative stereotypes of Liverpudlians. In 2000, the show was ranked number 88 on the 100 Greatest British Television Programs list compiled by the British Film Institute. The title is a reference to the marriage liturgy from the Book of Common Prayer. The series became an instant hit because, although a comedy, in the context of its time it did deal with aspects of working class life comparatively realistically. It addressed racial and political issues at a difficult time in British society. Mitchell imbued the character of Alf Garnet with an earthy charm that served to humanize Alf and make him likable. According to interviews he gave, the fact that some viewers overlooked Alf's racist views and regarded him as a rough diamond disappointed Spade. The show captured a key feature of Britain in the 1960s, the public perception that the generation gap was widening. Alf, and to a lesser degree his wife, represented the old guard. The traditional and conservative attitudes of the older generation. Alf's battles with his left wing son in law were not just ideological but generational and cultural. His son in law and daughter represented the younger generation. They supported the aspects of the new era such as relaxed sexual mores, fashions, music, etc. The same things were anathema to Alf and indicative of everything that was wrong with the younger generation and the liberal attitudes they embraced. Alf was portrayed as the archetypal working class conservative. The subjects that excited him most were football and politics, though his actual knowledge of either was limited. He used language not considered acceptable for television in the 1960s. He often referred to racial minorities as coons and similar terms. He referred to his Liverpudlian son in law as Shirley Temple or Randy Scousekit, Randy Scousekit, as a phrase, caught the ear of Mickey Dolans of the Monkees who heard it while on tour in the UK and used it as the title of the group's next single though their record label renamed it Alternate Title and Theog Market to avoid controversy, and to his wife as a silly, old, moo, a substitute for cow which was vetoed by the BBC's head of comedy Frank Muir. However, Michael Palin writes in his diary for July 16, 1976 that Warren Mitchell told him that silly moo wasn't scripted, it came out during a rehearsal when forgot the line silly old mare. Controversially, the show was one of the earliest mainstream programs to feature the swear word bloody apostrophe. The show was one of many held up by Mary Whitehouse as an example of the BBC's moral laxity. In a demonstration of Spate's satirical skills, after a successful libel action brought against Spate by Mary Whitehouse, he created an episode, first broadcast on February 27, 1967, in which Alf Garnet is depicted as an admirer of Whitehouse. Garnet was seen proudly reading her first book. What are you reading? His son-in-law asks. When he relates that it is Mary Whitehouse, his son-in-law sniggers. Alf's rejoinder is she's concerned for the bleed and moral fiber of the nation. The episode ends with the book being burned. Ultimately silly moo became a comic catchphrase. Another garnet phrase was it stands to reason, usually before making some patently unreasonable comment. Alf was an admirer of Enoch Powell, 
a right-wing conservative politician known particularly for strong opposition to the immigration of non witresses into the United Kingdom. Alf was also a supporter of West Ham United, a football club based in the East End, and known to make derogatory remarks about the Jews up at Spurs, referring to Tottenham Hotspur, a North London club with a sizable Jewish following. This was a playful touch by Spate, knowing that in real life Mitchell was both Jewish and a Spurs supporter. In interviews, Spate explained he had originally based Alf on his father, an East End docker who was staunchly reactionary and held an enlightened attitude toward black people. Spate made clear that he regretted that his father held such attitudes, which Spate regarded as reprehensible. Spate saw the show as a way of ridiculing such views and dealing with his complex feelings about his father. However, it was later claimed in the book about the series, A Family at War by Mark Ward, that the only similarities between Alf and Johnny Spade's father was that his father was a hard-working East End working-class docker and manual laborer who voted conservative and revered traditional British values Woe well, was very polite to any and everyone he met no matter their background. It is claimed that Johnny picked up the idea for Alf's bigoted personality from train station porters he had worked with in temporary jobs working for British Rail in the London area. The political views of both Alf and Mike were reflective of Johnny's own perception of people both on the left and the right, with the ignorance and bigotry of those on the right represented by Alf and the idealism of many sections of the left represented by Mike. Johnny Spade's own political views were that he was a left-winger, with frustrations about the class system on capitalism in general, but he found that the political parties on the left were, in his mind, ludicrous and out of touch with reality. This opinion was strengthened by his brief member of the UK Communist Party. It is likely that the character of Mike was based on the people he came into contact with at left-wing, Labour Party rallies and on those he met during his brief membership of the Communist Party. Johnny Spate gained a reputation for late delivery of scripts, sometimes unfinished and still in the form of rough notes, which would be finished and finalized as a script by the script editor and cast during rehearsals, either close to, on, or occasionally past the deadline. This was claimed by Spate to ensure maximum topicality for the series, although this was disputed by the program's first producer, Dennis Main Wilson, who stated that Johnny Spate was frequently found late at night in a regular selection of West End bars and on more than one occasion, had to be physically dragged out of such establishments by Wilson and driven home to get the scripts typed up and finished. This was the reason for the second series being 10 episodes long rather than the Commission 13. As three scripts that were scheduled to be recorded and broadcast towards the end of that series were not ready and actors, crew and Johnny Spate had already been paid in advance for 13 episodes, it was decided that an Easter Monday bank holiday special, till closing time us do part, would be made and that this would mostly be made up of the cast and crew ad living within the broad confines of a plot. For accounting reasons, this would be considered an 11th episode of the second series. At double the usual length, it also made up for screen time of a 12th episode. The addition of this episode meant that only one week's worth of pay was wasted, rather than three. Normally, a sitcom would have plenty of time, ranging from several weeks to several months, between recording and transmission to iron out any such script delivery problems. However, to ensure maximum topicality, most episodes of the second series of Till Death Us Do Part were recorded less than seven days before their intended transmission date, and as all studios would be booked on other nights for other, sometimes more important, productions, this meant that the recording of Till Death Us Do Part episodes could not be moved to another night or another studio should the script not be ready in time for rehearsals or recording. Should this happen, which it did towards the end of the second series, this would mean no episode ready for transmission that weekend because of the less than seven days gap between recording and transmission, no ready-made stockpile of new, untransmitted episodes to replace them. Other programs had to be used to fill in the schedule in the last three planned weeks of the second series 13 episode run. It is because of these problems of topicality delaying, sometimes cancelling, scripts that the third series is noticeably less topical than the second and had some weeks between recording and transmission to act as a cushion to ensure continuity of the series should one or more episodes fall through. The late delivery of scripts had been a problem that had first reared its head during production of the first series. The second series got off to a good start in these respect with the first four scripts being delivered ahead of the deadline, but it became clear as that series wore on that spate was having these problems again. Amongst a myriad of other problems, detailed below, the final straw for the original run appears to have been a script in the final, third, series of eight episodes not being delivered in time for rehearsals to begin and thus losing one episode. 
This confirmed to the BBC their suspicions that Spade was not an ideal writer to be writing for a topical sitcom like this. To combat these problems, it was suggested by the production team that there be windows or spaces within the script that could easily be excised and replaced with more topical jokes, a frequent tactic used in other topical sitcoms like Yorkshire Television's The New Statesman 20 years later, a suggestion that was initially refused by Spade in the 1960s run of the series but which was taken up during the 1970s run. This came to be particularly useful to ensure maximum topicality during the 1974 series some episodes of which reflected and satirized the UK miners' strike and the three-day week. However, Spate's initial refusal to accept these suggestions, combined with his constant demands of pay increases, eventually becoming the highest-paid comedy writer and then, after another increase, the highest-paid TV writer, during a time of strict public sector pay restraints imposed by the Labour government of Harold Wilson, which was a source of particular embarrassment to the BBC and the increasing clashes he and the BBC were having with Mary Whitehouse came to a head. Over time, Mary Whitehouse and the NVLA had several court cases with the BBC directly or indirectly related to the series, some of which Mrs. Whitehouse or the NVLA won. During the first two series, the program was originally broadcast on weeknights in a 7.30 p.m. time slot far ahead of the post-9 p.m. watershed and both Mrs. Whitehouse and Johnny Spate campaigned for such a change in scheduling the only aspect of the program at Hat White House and Spade agreed upon. The reluctance of the BBC to reschedule the series at first can possibly be explained in the fact that the watershed was a relatively new phenomenon at the time and there was no consensus between the BBC and the EDA over what should and shouldn't constitute family-friendly broadcasting, nor when this watershed should start, the responsibility over what constituted family-friendly viewing being primarily placed with the parents. Public outcry over the episode The Blood Donor as being a particularly distasteful episode and a new chairman of the BBC Board of Governors, Lord Hill, who had been appointed as Lord Normanbrook's successor when Normanbrook died suddenly in June 1967, taking a rather different, more conservative approach to the running of the BBC than the liberal and laid-back attitude of his predecessor were two other factors that turned up the heat of criticism against the series. Lord Hill had previously been the chairman of the Independent Television Authority and ensured that that station, ITV, remained relatively controversy-free. He shared many of the same opinions as Mrs. Whitehouse and the wider NVLA, which also clashed with the opinions of the then BBC Director General, Hugh Carlton Green. He is quoted as having the utmost contempt for Hill, who had been the series' biggest champion and gleefully ignored Mrs. Whitehouse whenever he had to. Many other members of BBC management also voiced their opinions directly to Hill over his appointment, most notably the then controller of BBC Two. David Attenborough, who compared Hill being chairman of the BBC Board of Governors to giving Rommel the command of the Eighth Army. It should be added that neither Hill, nor his predecessor, nor Manbrook, had any direct influence over the series itself, as the BBC charter prohibits this, but their relationship with the Director General indirectly influenced the program. Because of his total personality and culture clash with Hill, Green resigned in July 1968, soon after the series ended its original run, and, with the series' biggest champion now out of the BBC, it looked like the Garnet family would be making no more new appearances on BBC television, at least for the time being. Another champion of the series, head of comedy output at the BBC, Frank Muir had resigned his post between the second and third series to take up a new, similar, post at David Frost's fledgling new ITV franchise London Weekend Television, which would launch on August 2, 1968. His replacement, Michael Mills, recognized that the series had enormous potential but didn't understand why it had to be so topical, controversial or full of swearing and blasphemy, which hugely irritated Spate. The final straw for the BBC at this time came when a script for the third series, which was intended to be made up of eight episodes, was so late that it missed the scheduled beginning of rehearsals. This episode was intended to be between the transmitted episodes 4 and 5 putting a break in the recording dates and letting to one week's less space between recording and transmission of episode. Given the problems the series had given the BBC with steep pay increases in the midst of a government-imposed public sector pay freeze, scripts being delivered in varying degrees of completeness, and sometimes not at all, several court cases, usually libel or blasphemy, hundreds of complaints, several run-ins with Mary Whitehouse and her NVLA, the loss of the series' two biggest champions, First Frank Muir then Hugh Carlton Green, the new management having different opinions over the program and the general stress its production placed on staff, 
primarily down to the incomplete script submitted by Spate, all despite its rating success over Rai TV, particularly over Coronation Street, in its first two series and its general popularity as a whole, contributed to the BBC getting cold feet over the program. A planned fourth series, scheduled for autumn 1968, was scrapped. The program was revived in 1972, during a time when the BBC were reviving some of their more successful sitcoms from the 1960s for color production Steptoe and Son being an example. A contributory factor to this decision may have been that, since the ITV franchise changes of the summer of 1968, ITV had paid a lot more attention to making sitcoms, particularly those featuring, and appealing to, the working class, which had previously been the preserve of the BBC during the 1960s. This can be attributed to as a direct effect of the popularity of Till Death Us Do Part, The Likely Lads and Steptoe and Son, which were the first sitcoms to truly depict the realities of working-class life in Britain, and were not set in typical middle-class sitcom suburbia. In amongst these programs, Till Death Us Do Part would not look as out of place as it did in the late 1960s, particularly now as the show would be less topical bar some 1974 episodes, but no less political or controversial as it had originally been. This was of great help to Spate, as it now meant that he didn't have Ado wait until the very last minute to submit completed or half-completed scripts. However, this was also the series' downfall, as viewers noted the increasingly less topical plots and the satire was much less vicious than it had been in the 1960s, with the style of the series in both 1975 series bearing little semblance to those transmitted in the late 1960s. Spade has put this down not only to reducing the pressures of working on a topical sitcom but also to his own personal declining interest in politics, which may be an explanation of why In Sickness and In Health was much less political and wasn't as vicious as its predecessor could be. Additionally, Towards the end of the series Dandy Nichols fell ill and was unable to attend the live audience recordings. So in a later episode Else was seen leaving for Australia, to Alf's dismay. Her scenes were recorded separately from the rest of the episodes. The plan was for Nichols to tape scenes from time to time set in Australia where she would phone Alf or Rita in one to two minute segments. But only one episode featured such a scene and the idea was dropped as Nichols' health was poor. Patricia Hayes who had been seen from time to time previously as next-door neighbor Min, became a starring character along with her husband Bert, previously played by Bill Maynard and now by Alfie Bass. The show's rating began to suffer and when it was clear Nichols was not returning as hoped by the writers, in 1975, the series was dropped. The final episode saw Alf lose his job and receive a telegram from Els asking for a divorce. As with most BBC sitcoms Till Death Us Do Part was recorded before a live studio audience. The programs were recorded onto two-inch quadruplex videotape. From 1966 to 1968 the show was transmitted in black and white. When the series returned in 1972, it was transmitted in color. The opening titles slash end credits of the first color episodes originally used the BW sequence from the 60s tinted in red, as seen on UK TV Gold repeats in 2006. The house scene in the opening and closing titles to the 1960s episodes was located on Garnet Street in Wapping, from where writer Johnny Spate took the Garnet family name. This terrace was demolished in June 1968 for road widening, which is why the street used in the 1969 film and the opening titles to the color episodes don't match with the houses used in the original opening sequence. Subsequent to this, in the 1980s, a terrace of newer multicolored homes and an estate agents took the places of the terraced estate. They are located on Garnet Street in close proximity to the local Wallace James Shop, St. Peter's Primary School, Gastronomica Bar, Docklands General Store and Crane Wharf. Most of the show's 26 episodes from Series 1 to 3 that were videotaped in black and white and broadcast 1965-68 no longer exist. They were wiped by the BBC during the late 1960s and early 1970s. Currently, most material from 12 episodes still survives, with one episode on the original tape and the rest on film or domestic formats. The surviving 1960s B&W episodes are, Arguments, Arguments, A House with Love in It, Intolerance, Peace and Goodwill, In Sickness and in Health, State Visit, Alf's Dilemma, Till Closing Time Do Us Part, The Phone, The Blood Donor, and Aunt Maud. Sequences exist from, the pilot episode, Sex Before Marriage, The Bulldog Breed, A Whopping Mythology, The Worker's King, and The Puppy. The public appeal campaign The BBC Archive Treasure Hunt continues to search for lost episodes.
In 1997 the long-lost episode Alf's Dilemma was found in a private collection on a 21-minute 16mm delay recording. This is the episode featuring Garnet reading Mary Whitehouse's first book. The episode was rebroadcast in 1998 on UK Gold. In August 2009, two more black and white episodes, In Sickness and In Health and State Visit, were returned by a film collector. Seven years later in August 2016, another episode Intolerance was finally recovered. In autumn 2017, a copy of Sex Before Marriage, second episode of the second series, was recovered. This episode was first broadcast on Monday 2 January 1967 on BBC One. Following its recovery to official archives, it was screened at the BFI's annual Missing Believed Wiped event on Saturday 16 December at Air South Bank venue. Network's complete DVD box set contains off-air audio recordings of what was then, late 2016. Every missing episode, including the audio from Sex Before Marriage. In 1980, the ITV company ATV picked up the series and produced a solo show starring Alf, titled The Thoughts of Chairman Alf at Christmas transmitted on 26 December. The master copy has been wiped, however, a home video recording is currently available to view at the National Media Museum, Bradford. In 1981, ATV made six episodes under the title Till Death. The series had Alf and Alf sharing a bungalow with Min, Patricia Hayes, following the death of her husband Bert, Alfie Bass, in Eastbourne. Although Rita remained in the cast, Anthony Booth declined to return. Rita's son Michael was now a teenager around a punk rocker, even though he was born in 1972 and therefore should only have been about 9 or 10. The series was not a success and when Central Television where he awarded the contract for the Midlands region from 1982, it was decided that till death was not to return. Alf Garnett returned to the BBC in 1985 for In Sickness and In Health. This took Alf and Alf, who was now in a wheelchair, onward into old age, and some of Alf's more extreme opinions were found to have mallowed. Eunice Stubbs made some guest appearances but Anthony Booth apparently wasn't interested in reprising his role. Eventually Mike and Rita divorced and Rita began dating a doctor. After the first series Dandy Nichols died and so subsequent episodes showed Alf having to deal with life as a widower. The loss of Alf, and later, Rita, as regulars in the cast meant that new characters had to be brought in as antagonists for Alf. These notably included his home help, Winston, played by Eamon Walker, who was both black and gay, and Alf's prim upstairs neighbor, Mrs. Hollingberry, played by Carmel McSherry, who eventually agreed to marry Alf. In 1988, Spate was warned about the use of racist language, and after discussion it was decided that Alf's racist language was to be discontinued and the character of Winston was to be written out. With such improvements helping update the basic concept, In Sickness and Health ran until 1992. Warren Mitchell also appeared solo on stage and TV as Alf Garnet, dispensing variations on Alf's homespun reactionary philosophy and singing old music hall songs most notably in the London Weekend television show An Audience with Alf Garnett. After Johnny Spate's death in July 1998, Warren Mitchell decided to retire the character of Alf Garnett. In the comedy Playhouse pilot, Alf's family name was Ramsey but the BBC changed his name to Garnet for the subsequent series, not wishing to have a character with the same name as England's 1966 Football World Cup winning manager. Two feature films were made based on the series, the first was Till Death Us Do Part, 1969, whose first half dealt with a younger Alf and Elf during World War II, and whose second half dealt with all the Garnets in the present day being moved from their East End slum to the new town of Hamel Hempstead, and the adjustments and changes that brought on the family. It gave a nuanced glimpse of British life at the time. The second film, The Alf Garnet Saga, 1972, had Adrian Posta playing the part of Rita and Paul Angelis playing Mike. It is notable for featuring Alf Garnet on an LSD trip. In the UK, Network previously released the first two color series, 4 and 5, on DVD, but these releases are no longer printed, the license had since expired and rights have reverted to BBC Worldwide, who released their titles through to entertain. Some fans have since urged BBC DVD to release the series, however, in Sickness and in Health had seen all six series and the Christmas specials being released on DVD by 2 Entertain. The fourth series was available in the United States and Canada, having been released before the network edition and featuring some title sequence variations. The 1969 movie is available in both the UK and the US, 
but the 1972 movie is only available on DVD via bootlegs. On December 5, 2016 Network Distributing, under license with BBC Worldwide and 2 Entertain, released the whole color series, 4 to 7, along with every surviving episode from the black and white series, 1 to 3, and off-air remastered audio recordings of all lost episodes, on DVD as an 8-disc box set included with a detailed booklet which includes black and white and color photographs, a story of and a full list of episode synopses. While the series is famous in the U.S. as the inspiration for All in the Family, Norman Lear also drew on his family's relationships and added some differences. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.